This episode was requested by my patron, Landon Bowers. You want a little bit of Ikea effect in your players. Spare Room with Karen Terry. Hey y'all, and welcome to Spare Room. I'm Karen Terry, and today we're going to talk about how to drive quality with constraint. Today we're going to talk about why it's important to have a specific character creation process for your roleplay group. We're going to talk about why it shouldn't be a free-for-all, but also why it shouldn't be so constrained that your players don't have any wiggle room when creating their characters. We're going to go over all of this and kind of where that line is so that you know what you should be aiming for. Before watching this video, I do recommend watching my creativity video, which I will link up in the card. That video goes over where ideas come from and why uniqueness isn't always the best goal for creativity. And understanding that concept is going to be important to understanding the concepts and whys for the stuff that we talk about today. All right, I'm going to assume you went ahead and watched that video and let's get into it. Every creative ever has done this. We've opened up a Word document or put the canvas on the easel and just stared at it. We start to think about how to actually form what we feel inside and we freeze. That overthinking is paralyzing. And the other thing that every creative knows is once you get those first few words down or those first few brush strokes, everything becomes so much easier. Giving just the smallest amount of form to what it is that you want to create gets that creativity flowing. You may even be left wondering why that first bit was so hard. Now, if you watch my creativity video, then you already know the answer to this. Ideas don't come from nowhere. So when we're staring at nothing, ideas don't come. So don't let your players stare at a blank page. You may think that you're freeing them by giving them no constraints. You may think that saying they can do whatever they want is a kindness, but it's not. Your job as the admin of setting up the role play is to give your players a template, an underpainting, instructions. You're going to make sure that page isn't blank. Now, just because you're going to give your players an outline doesn't mean you're going to do all the work for them. So what's the difference? Imagine playing Dungeons and Dragons, and instead of being part of the character creation process, your DM just hands you a character sheet all filled out. This can work in certain contexts, like maybe you have a group of all brand new players and they're overwhelmed by the character creation process. Or maybe you have a group of veterans that need to be pushed out of their comfort zone. But typically, you want your players to have buy-in with these characters, and that means they need to be part of the character creation process. You want a little bit of IKEA effect in your players. The IKEA effect is a cognitive bias where you place higher value on something you created or at least partially created yourself. You're more likely to love that IKEA bookshelf you put together than the bookshelf you bought already built, even if you did a poor job putting together the IKEA bookshelf and its clearly lower quality. If your players created their characters themselves, they're far more likely to love the characters than if you as the admin just handed them a character. So, where you want to have the most bang for your buck is to have your players make around two to four major decisions about the character. Why do I say two to four? I've landed on this number based on both my experience and what I know about memory and how information is stored in the brain. So how much data can we store in our brains anyway? According to Dr. Paul Reber, professor of psychology at Northwestern University, the human brain consists of about 1 billion neurons. Each neuron forms about 1,000 connections to other neurons, amounting to more than a trillion connections. Neurons combine so that each one helps us with many memories at a time, exponentially increasing the brain's memory storage capacity to something closer to around 2.5 petabytes, or a million gigabytes. For comparison, if your brain worked like a digital video recorder in a television, 2.5 petabytes would be enough to hold 3 million hours of TV shows. You would have to leave the TV running continuously for more than 300 years to use up all that storage. Oh my god, that's a lot of information. That being said, obviously we can't access that and think about all of that information all at once. So maybe a better question is how many ideas can we hold in our heads at the same time? 
Imagine you're boarding an airplane, and as you walk down the gangway, you pull out your ticket to check your seat number. B33, okay, you've got it. You take your ticket, you put it in your pocket. When you get on the plane, a long line of passengers is there also searching for your seats, and you have to kind of slowly make your way down the airplane aisle, right? Do you remember what your ticket number was? No, you don't. That ticket is coming right back out of your pocket so you can double check again. The moment you cross the threshold onto the plane and realize you had to wait much longer, you have totally forgotten what that ticket number is. And that has nothing to do with how fast or creative or intelligent you are. That is simply how working memory operates. All right, so airplane ticket example aside, how does working memory actually work and how many ideas can you hold in your head? For this, we use Miller's Law. What Miller's Law says is that the average amount of things we can hold in our head at once is about seven, plus or minus two. And there's a whole psychological paper that explores this and explains how it works. I've got sources down in the description where you can find that. So what this means is if players have to juggle more than seven pieces of information at once, you potentially have an issue and you could run into it during your character creation process. And if you have this come up multiple times during your character creation process, you've made it too difficult. I have found that the typical player that I'm looking for in my roleplay will make a complicated decision like this between two and four times before they give up and just don't ever make a character to join the roleplay with. For those closer to the two side of that, I have open character skeletons that they can start with. And for those closer to the four side, they can create their own character from scratch. And if you'd like a video talking about those different biotypes and how they work and how I utilize them in my role plays, let me know down below. I can make a video all about that process and those different biotypes and what you might want to use in your role play. Ultimately, what you don't want is for someone to have to hold too much stuff in their head to be able to make the decisions that they need to make about their character when they're creating them. But on the flip side, you have to give them something to grab onto because staring at that blank page is way too hard. And now that we know how working memory operates, combined with knowing how creativity works in the brain, we know this is the best way to get the most creativity out of your players. So what do you guys think? Do you guys already do this in your role plays without really even thinking about it? Or have you thought about this before? Or maybe now that you know this, you'll make some changes and restructures to how your character creation is set up in your role play. Let me know all of that down below. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day.